Hello, welcome everybody. This is, um, I'd like to welcome you to the CCSR Surveillance Group. Um, today we've got an esteemed speaker, uh, Professor David Lyon from Queen's University over in Ontario and Canada. Um, he is a well-renowned uh, surveillance expert and sociologist, and uh, he is here to, to give us a talk about surveillance and the pandemic. So whenever you're ready, Professor Lyon, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you for your welcome. I am uh, I'm happy to be here uh, with you in uh, virtual terms. Um, nearly 50 years ago, I actually got married in Leicester. Um, I wasn't living in Leicester, and neither was my wife to be, but um, there we were. We were in Leicester to be married, so I have a connection with the city. Um, okay, I'm talking about pandemic surveillance uh, this afternoon. And uh, this is something, uh, a particular topic that uh, needless to say, I've only had a chance to uh, think about very seriously in the past uh, nine months. Pandemic surveillance as uh, I'm understanding it refers most obviously to the kinds of surveillance catalyzed by the COVID-19 pandemic. From interpersonal contact tracing to global tracking of the movements of the virus, uh, and of course now its mutations. This indicates a major development in contemporary surveillance. Arguably, the plethora of uh, new developments puts the post 9-11 explosion of surveillance in the shade. This development deserves close and careful scrutiny both of what is actually occurring and of its implications for policy and regulation of data extraction, analysis, and use. And this is what I'm thinking of as the surveillance of the pandemic. But following that observation, the phrase also conjures a further sense in which the surveillance itself displays pandemic aspects, a pandemic of surveillance. It appears to go viral, spreading extremely rapidly and to an extent unpredictably. Like COVID-19, surveillance jumps from one domain to another, perhaps outdating the earlier notion of surveillance creep, which is a pro which, uh, process is often much more slow and subtle. The year 2020 marked the start of an unprecedented surveillance outbreak. As the pandemic affects different populations in varying ways, so also surveillance operates all too often along historically familiar lines of socioeconomic and related disadvantage. And of course, there are other uh, tracks along which it travels as well. And as the pandemic prompts crisis talk, it presents understandable preoccupations with short-term technical fixes, such as contact tracing or rapidly developed vaccines. Thus, attention is deflected from its causes. Those pandemic producing factors are anthropogenic. They're human generated. They're breakdowns in relationships between human beings and the environment, especially flora and fauna. Zoonotic disease in this case, seen first in the virus jumping from wildlife to humans in the Wuhan uh, Hunan wholesale seafood market in China, is facilitated precisely by the rapid shrinkage of species due to industrial agriculture, uh, deforestation, and the like. Surveillance too, in its current manifestations, is also conducted in ways that echo parallel relationship breakdowns seen strikingly in surveillance capitalism. And of course, as with all metaphors, there are strict limits to the parallels that I'm drawing here. I offer them only to stimulate reflection, not to engage in some kind of reductionism or naively to equate surveillance with disease. The pandemic metaphor, uh, sorry, the pandemic me surveillance metaphor offers no more than a perspective, a way of seeing. But it can, however, offer some clues about what sorts of theory might help us 
and guide our explorations and our understanding of surveillance in a time of pandemic and beyond. <clears throat> Here, I want to make the case that the human production of the pandemic and specifically of surveillance solutions to it are best, uh, are, are best considered in terms of broken but potentially restorable relationships. So let me tighten the focus a bit after those uh, introductory comments. The most obvious example of pandemic surveillance is the worldwide array of contact tracing schemes. South Korea, as you probably know, took, uh, rapidly took the lead in this based on their experience with another epidemic, MERS, in 2015. From that time, a law already existed allowing authorities to use data from credit cards, mobile phones, CCTV, and so on for the purpose. But the Center for Disease Control had to warn against too much information being published about people's movements as the, the uh, systems developed in South Korea. Uh, someone, for example, was wrongly accused of having an affair with his sister-in-law when their overlapping maps suggested that they'd had a restaurant date. Contact tracing is a painstaking process. It works most effectively when infections are still rare and when testing is re readily available for all. But in a world where consumers have been taught that there's an app for that, automating the manual process seems attractive. Many contact tracing schemes use apps that inform others who've recently been close, say two meters uh, apart for uh, around 15 minutes, close to an infected person. Singapore's Trace Together system, for example, now also used in parts of Australia, began hopefully with public health criteria to the fore, but it never reached the critical 60% take up rate that might have made it fully functional. Mm. In China, where the pandemic allegedly began, contact tracing apps are common. You can walk up to the store, pull up the app, scan a QR code, and wait for your temperature to be taken. When you see the green light, you proceed into the store. Same again when you exit. If your light is yellow, you must self-quarantine at home. If red, you have to go into a supervised quarantine. Drones and facial recognition systems are also used for checking up on quarantine and self-isolation. Pandemic surveillance is firstly about these new surveillance initiatives, the use of data to keep watch over people threatened by the disease. And I'm not for a moment underestimating the need to try to deal with uh, human suffering and human uh, vulnerability to disease. The system systematic, routine, and focused attention to these details for finding out who is at risk uh, is what makes this surveillance. Contact tracing apps, for example, document where people are and what is their health status. As, noticed, uh, as noted, it may involve policing their movements as well. Other initiatives involve things like modeling, analyzing the spread of the virus using health data, and, uh, and other forms of data that are publicly available. The, uh, this has become a major surveillance operation for COVID-19 as public health data is being used in novel ways to grasp pandemic realities. But they also throw up many urgent issues about which data, race-based data, for example, may be used for what purposes how those data are collated and how algorithms, those codes that guide the analysis and conclusions are developed. More, more broadly, they thrust into view basic questions of trust in government to do the right thing. Google and Apple who offered government bodies the infrastructure, uh, the API for contact tracing apps still set the rules for their production governments could only, who were going to use the uh, Google Apple um, connection could only operate within the rules that were set by Apple and Google. Governments have long had access to health data, of course, along with statistical data about populations. But what about location data? 
now routinely used by numerous platforms, to great profit, of course. Should governments take advantage of the available availability of such very revealing and socially sensitive data during a public health crisis? These questions are of the essence as surveillance mushrooms in the pandemic. The examples that I've been using so far indicate clearly how the pandemic is not only a medical or health condition, but also a social and profoundly political condition. Michel Foucault famously linked responses to 18th century plagues with the rise of more disciplinary governments. And this was before he ever discussed the Panopticon. Unless we're directly, uh, directly affected through infection, the ways we experience a pandemic is primarily through lockdowns and business closures, that which was in our conversation just before we began. These limit our normal activities and behavior. But the lockdowns and limits on life as we knew it have knock-on effects in other areas as well. Simultaneously with contact tracing, and public health data tracking, numerous other surveillance devices and systems also appeared with great rapidity in 2020, 2021. I don't have time this afternoon to go into a lot of details around this, but the areas I think will be obvious to you. So it's in the monitoring of remote working, for example, a huge, a huge uptick in the uh, ways in which employers have taken advantage of uh, digital systems to monitor their employees in their remote settings, whatever those settings may be. But then there's also uh, the policing of learning, uh, what happens in online learning in uh, high schools and universities in particular, uh, again, offers a, a massive expansion on what went on before, even if there were already existing platforms in use for uh, keeping students in touch with the material and the syllabus, the number of devices now also offering uh, further monitoring have uh, multiplied. And then there's also, of course, the profiling of online shoppers. Now, online shopping was a thing, long before the pandemic, but in many countries it has rapidly become a much bigger phenomenon and the kinds of surveillance that are associated with online shopping have certainly not diminished. In fact, they too have uh, increased to a very great extent. Those are just three areas we can talk about, the uh, monitoring of leisure activities and, and so on, but just, just those three, I think, are enough to think about. And these fast expanding developments illustrate COVID-19 as a social condition. And though they're prompted by public health crises, they touch on a range of other areas of social life and are no less participating in what I think of as pandemic surveillance. If one was a uh, follower of uh, Foucault's work, one could ask of uh, Foucault's work, what could be said about current partnerships between government and corporations? That was not something that really entered into uh, Foucault's work or about the data-driven and digital character of contemporary surveillance, again, about which Foucault had nothing to say. It certainly seems likely that pandemic surveillance will have long-term negative effects on social inequalities and human rights and freedoms. And while the pandemic, like 9-11 surveillance, may be viewed as a state of exception, such states can easily be normalized, as we saw with uh, the persistence of em emergency measures originating in the two, uh, 2001 attacks. Of course, it also goes without saying that surveillance varies by country or even by province or state. It's vital to examine different forms of pandemic surveillance in health-related and other areas. 
drawing illustrations from countries around the world. And I think there's a tremendous amount to be learned through comparative study, uh, which of course is in part facilitated by the uh, huge surge in new uh, platforms for just such communications as we are engaged in right now. But there are many differences that go on between different countries and regions and uh, the comparison and contrast between them, I think is not just fascinating, but it's also very instructive for the way in which we understand pan pandemic surveillance. Illustrations can be drawn from countries uh, around the world. Uh, I've done some thinking about Australia, uh, Brazil, Canada, uh, China, India, Israel, Italy, Singapore, and as I say, South Korea, the UK, and, uh, and the USA. And there, again, there are, there are many other examples of uh, important and, uh, as I say, instructive developments that have taken place in, uh, in each of those countries. Uh, I name the ones that I do simply because we have uh, colleagues who are working in those countries and uh, with whom we've had uh, very good conversations and contact and shared ideas about pandemic surveillance. In many places, for example, such as India and India and Mexico, there's much confusion and controversy, particularly over the legality of mandatory contact tracing apps. Um, huge confusion. And of course, those kinds of confusions are likely to make the very system that uh, is the subject of the confusion less useful. Uh, in India, for example, uh, the uh, national government had a, uh, what they said was a, a mandatory um, contact tracing app. And uh, immediately there was both confusion about who it was mandatory for, was it primarily for uh, government employees and anyone in the public service, or was it mandatory for everyone? And uh, lawsuits were produced, particularly in Kerala, uh, challenging the government's requirements. So if, if that sort of thing occurs in the context of a pandemic, when you are trying as quickly as possible to try to control the virus, uh, the lack of careful thought that went into the communication of what was the uh, what was required within the system is uh, clearly problematic. Similarly, in Mexico, uh, a mandatory system was uh, was set up. This had to do with uh, uh, QR code, and uh, again, there was huge confusion and huge opposition, including from former. Um, privacy commissioner in, uh, in Mexico City. So there are many uh, issues and uh, interesting examples for us to follow up in, a, uh, in an interdisciplinary, uh, sorry, in an international fashion, international comparative fashion, as we're looking at pandemic surveillance. But in each place and in each case, we are obliged to look at the uh, and, and explore the benefits and disadvantages of the various initiatives that have been proffered, their legal status, how far they might become permanent, how they relate to things like data protection and privacy, uh, and as I shall say, to an ethics of care and to data justice. Pandemic surveillance also speaks to the character of surveillance today. Surveillance, I've argued uh, for quite a while, flows like liquid in the present. But in the pandemic context, as I say, there are ways of uh, seeing surveillance actually jumping, as it were, from one organism to another. And that surveillance, just like the pandemic virus, uh, also affects others exponentially. The virus also ex affects different populations differently, as I said earlier, those already vulnerable to factors such as age, class, race, gender, and so on, are rendered more prone to the disease. Also true of surveillance. The more surveillance depends on algorithmic distinctions, the more its social sorting deepens disadvantage. The advent of coronavirus was not unpredictable. It was prompted by special factors dependent on human responsibility, declining biodiversity, 
caused by industrial agriculture, deforestation, and so on. Getting infected is not just a matter of viruses entering the body. The virus travels along lines determined by social class, geography, even political climate. Surveillance too expands predictably above all along lines provided by today's digital expansion through platforms. This is an environment which in many countries makes much difference in how the virus is experienced. Pandemic surveillance also mirrors COVID in its attraction to techno-solutionism, technical fixes. Contact tracing apps and the frenzied quest for vaccines being two obvious examples of techno-solutionism. And if you are attracted to techno-solutionism, it's highly, highly likely that that is a singular and uh, focused attraction. In, in reality, what happens is that the causes of the kinds of surveillance now practiced, primarily surveillance capitalism, um, just as the other pandemic approaches seem to ignore the destruction of biodiversity that facilitates zoonotic disease. Surveillance capitalism for somebody like Shoshana Zuboff, whose name is most famously associated with the term, is, uh, as she says, the unilateral claiming of private human experience as raw material for translation into behavioral data. It's basically the commodification of personal data for profit and is implicated in many developments in pandemic surveillance. And again, in each context, I would suggest, uh, finding modes of relating appropriately with the natural world and with each other is key to any appropriate resolution of our current woes. Always questions need to be discussed critically, in my view, with a view to considering how far pandemic surveillance and the surveillance pandemic contribute to human flourishing. More, particular, uh, more particularly, questions are raised about how far an ethics of care and demands for data justice are present within these initiatives. These go well beyond familiar calls for privacy and data protection, which though still salient, have been overtaken by the swiftness of today's surveillance innovations and require radical rethinking and a new politics. So where do we go from here? Pandemic surveillance highlights not only the magnitude of COVID-19 related surveillance expansion, but also the urgent need for new perspectives and first policies relating to surveillance in the 21st century. So as well as trying to understand how the pandemic has opened new possibilities for algorithmic platform-based surveillance, we're also obliged to consider alternatives to present circumstances and trends. If pandemic surveillance confronts us with the kinds of questions that I've tried to outline in a few minutes here, then offering different perspectives, different ways of seeing is also vital. And one of the key issues, as I say, is techno-solutionism, which we could argue is a matter of misplaced trust. It's to put all human hopes into what Jacques Ellul back in the 1950s and 60s called la technique. He saw technology as something that was being wrenched out of its place as a human strategy for opening up the possibilities of the planet, for overcoming obstacles and limits, and of becoming an end in itself. Attempts to contain and eliminate the pandemic will be only techno-solutionist band-aids unless they're linked with serious environmental action to recover planetary diversity, uh, planetary biodiversity in particular. At present, there's a deadly inverse relationship between species depletion and the likelihood of more zoonotic pandemics. The relationships between humans and the environment are not merely disharmonious, they're mutually lethal. Restoring appropriate respect and cooperation between peoples and the planet is the only hope. And although some forms of surveillance are undoubtedly needed to help the struggle against the marauding virus, treating surveillance as a fix for aspects of the problem is bound to fail. For it isn't carried out in ways that foster data justice with an eye to rights and to human flourishing, it will continue as it has in the past to undermine relationships, to destroy trust, that most basic human bonding agent, and to create, exacerbate 
and reproduce social inequality and disadvantage. I can't say very much about the ways in which relationships might be repaired uh, between humans and the earth. This is not my uh, scientific speciality at all, except to say that the issues are clearly extremely urgent and require globally concerted action from governments and expert bodies, as well as from many millions of ordinary citizens who care about species depletion and its dire effects on planet and people. But anyway, people like Greta Thunberg are much better spokespersons than I am on this. But with respect to surveillance, several things can be said following the lines of argument that I've tried to present. The breakdown of relationships that I have in mind has to do with the over-reliance on distanced uh, means of determining outcomes, what I think of as social sorting and automated inequality, based on algorithms that all too often reproduce already existing social cleavages and power structures. These lie behind the pandemic tools, such as contact tracing and indeed the larger systems of public health data platforms. What they tend to miss is the reality of the ordinary lives of those who are most vulnerable, the usual suspects that routinely experience negative effects of historical forms of disadvantage. And this, I think, calls for more interaction and cooperation between scholars from different disciplines, but also for guidance from those directly involved in things like software engineering and the uh, construction of algorithms. At this point, an ethics of care is, I believe, a paramount need. As Lynette Martin observes, science and policy could be able to control the panic better by addressing the sources of uncertainty and missing data, not as gaps in the information landscape, but as individuals who are likely to be members of less visible and less powerful groups, including low wage workers, the elderly, migrants, prisoners, and others. And she says this would shift both data and data use and policy towards an ethics of care, an embodied approach that which asks what people need and how they behave in relation to each other rather than how to manage population level behavior. And this applies to uh, all kinds of basic ways of doing digital surveillance that it be guided by notions of data justice. And that larger concept has to do with uh, ensuring that there is fairness in the ways that people are made visible, are represented and treated. But there's one other factor to be considered that the apps, devices and systems don't work for the advertised purposes. But this isn't, doesn't necessarily slow their production, adoption and use as has been seen repeatedly in the surveillance field from CCTV onwards. Again, this requires interdisciplinary work, but also that computer scientists and social scientists in particular finds mode of operating beyond the all too common dissociation and disengagement that characterizes much in the computing sciences, including in the universities. Computing sciences also do not exist on their own. They're also from such, also for some larger purpose. Okay, those are the remarks that I want to make about uh, pandemic surveillance. And um, I look forward to your comments, criticisms, questions uh, as we go forward.